Chapter 36 With Safety of His Innocence John Wesley had no use in his left hind leg now at all. His movement was handicapped and heavy, and the night was dark, the darker for the snow falling. But he could not bear to see the two coyote bodies simply sink in the snow. He couldn't bear for snow to sift into the mama's mouth or to drift on Benoni's face. They lay near one another on the terrace where they died, exactly as the animals had left them at leaving. It was up to John now. The babies, twill and hopsacking, had fallen asleep against each other, tired for staying in the den and waiting for their mother to come. That was a goodness that they slept. So John had gone out. He had pulled himself to Benoni, and he was stroking the child to brush the snow away and he was thinking that there should be some place, a fine and private, empty place, for Benoni and his mama to lie together. He was thinking, why couldn't he find such a place? Or was there such a place in all the world where nobody would hurt them again? He was thinking these things when Ferrick came. Oh, said Ferrick, and Joss, John saw him, and he stopped stroking the baby. The coyote stood with his side to the wall, as though shy. A bird slipped from his back. The coyote put his cheek to the wall, too, and closed his eyes. Oh, no, he said. John said, Papa? The bird huddled in the snow. The coyote pushed and pushed himself against the wall as if it would give way for him. When he glanced at the bodies, he pushed harder. All at once, he stood straight up with a busy expression on his face. He looked at Rachel, and he said, One. He looked at Benoni, and he said, Two. Then he looked with infinite questioning at the weasel, and poor John didn't know what to say. One, whined the coyote. It was a terribly important number, and the next was worse. Two, he pleaded with John. Two. John felt pity and in utter helplessness. But Papa, he whispered, what's for a W to say? One, begged Ferrick, nearly desperate. Two, who could understand them? Suddenly he ran to the den. He thrust his head inside and stood still. Then he backed out again. Three, he said. Four, he said, thinking long about these numbers. Oh, Papa, John Wesley cried too loud. It's okay, them babies is sleeping. Sleeping, said the coyote, fixing John, the savior, with a hungry stare. Sleeping, do you think? He came to John. He looked directly into John's eyes. Do you know, Rachel? He asked. Um, yes. John dropped his own eyes. Is Mama Coyote, yes, he said. Ferrick said, Please, what is your name? Um, well, John, said the weasel. John, said the coyote with true fervor. John, is Rachel sleeping too? The weasel mumbled, no. Oh, please, John. The coyote's eyes were burning him. Not sleeping. What else is there? If she isn't sleeping, then what is she, John? Wouldn't Coyote, doesn't you know? Rachel is my wife, said the Coyote, as though this information might assist the weasel. Nothing ever troubles her. She doesn't worry about anything. She smiles. Wouldn't Coyote, said John, don't. She knows how to laugh. Wouldn't Coyote? What? Rachel, she's dead. No. Oh, wouldn't Coyote, oh yes. She is. Do you, said Ferrick, still glaring at John, do you know a pup, a brave pup named Benoni? John Wesley Weasel simply turned and began to drag his useless leg away. He is my son, the coyote continued to talk to the spot where the weasel had been. He is my, he is. John passed the darkness of the den. Oh, coyote, he whispered to the night. John, he is so sorry for all we has done to you. But there was a silence behind him. 
he turned back and saw that the thin coyote had finally looked upon his family. As gently as the snow itself, he was dipping his snout to the woman, Rachel, stretched upon the ground. Tenderly he licked her face. Tenderly he washed her. Then he stopped with his nose on her forehead. He began to shiver. He drew his lips back until it seemed that he was grinning. His nose pressed to her brow. But he wasn't grinning. His voice was thick. Rachel, he said. Rachel, I'm so cold. Are you cold, too? John Wesley wanted to race up the stone steps and away, screaming curses at the universe, but he bowed his head instead. And then the scream came, but it wasn't his own. The poor coyote wailed, Benoni! Benoni! Why is your tongue stuck out? Couldn't someone put your tongue away? Oh, Benoni! John tried as hard as he could to get to the steps, wounded by the coyote's cry, feeling his own tears start at his eyes. But, John, cried the coyote again in the night, where are you? Here, wooden coyote, he said. Is Twill sleeping? Is Hopsacking sleeping? Yes, wooden coyote. I mean sleeping. Yes, wooden coyote, yes. Don't go. John, he gots to go. Please, John, please, there's something you have to tell me. Oh, wooden coyote, let John go. Just one more thing. Farrick bounded toward the weasel, then immediately turned away, dropping his head between the bodies and the ground itself, but unable to look at the weasel any more. What, wooden coyote? Tell me. Farrick ceased in shivering. I'm sorry, I'm cold, he said. Indeed, the blizzard was just beginning above them, and the wind said, Roo! in the pine. Can you tell me again, said Farrick humbly, what Benoni said about his papa? John Wesley choked. Poor John, he was stuck all over again, and what was he to do? Benoni says he misses his papa said John, and they both began to cry together. The coyote lay down to weep. John looked at the furry pup form, lying like his father, one and two. Benoni says he loves his papa with a very big, big love. Farrick wept. Thank you, John. And John Wesley wept. Is nothing's wooden coyote. When coyotes howl in the dead of night, a long and plaintive wailing, when they round their mouths to the empty sky and sing shrill notes, this is what they say. They say, son of my sorrow, where have you gone? They are the voice, lamentation, and bitter weeping. They are weeping for their children, and they refuse to be comforted for their children because they are not. This is the way of the world. The children die. John Wesley heard that howling when the storm began. He heard it in spite of the blizzard, in spite of the pine around him, in spite of the fact that Ferrick was wailing from the bottom of the canyon louder. He heard it because Ferrick was wailing to heaven itself. Chapter 37 Home to Coma Black pale on a silver field, he thought no thoughts whatever while he ran. It was an impulse of the heart that drove him. It was right to go fast, that was all. It was right never, never to stop. It was right to reach the extremities of physical exertion, to crack his lungs in the run, to hear a mortal rattling there, to taste the blood. He asked no farther than rightness just now. The rightness was all, no reasons, no reasons. But there was a reason. In fact, there were two. Barely felt at the tip of his hoof, but tingling there, however hard or often he struck the ground, was the sensation of a soft snap. Black Pale was fleeing the name of that feeling. He was escaping the remembrance of the act and the title that should attach to him forever for what he had done. But names and memories are swifter than wind in pursuit. 
Therefore he couldn't pause, not for an instant, and therefore he ran as fast as he possibly could. He was racing thought itself, and he sought fatigue, and he wished to be tired, and he wanted to drop unconscious before his body hit the ground. But God had given him a remarkable heart, both noble and strong. He ran. He accomplished a marvel, though no one ever knew it. A ground in snow, the stag ran faster, longer than the hawk in the air could fly. A grueling, unrecorded marathon. And the reason why, all thoughtlessly, he tended toward the hemlock was, he wanted to see his daughter. He never once thought this yearning through, it was too dangerous to consider. Yet in him was the terrible need to see if she was still all right, more precisely, to see if she was still alive. Mindless, then, the stag broke into the camp of the animals, woofing a hollow, wretched breath, stamping the ground because he could not be still and because he was seeking his daughter. His nostrils hung whips of mucus that lashed him when he threw his head from side to side, seeking. The mucus was strung with beads of a startling red. Have you seen her? He rasped to no one in particular. Would have heard none if any had answered. But the animals simply stood aside. He looked fanatical. Have you seen her? He asked with greater intensity, rushing among the breeds. The intensity grew in him, because his own words told him why he'd come, for her. Thought was waking, and, it with, and with it a true panic for the fawn. At the Liverbrook, finally, he abused his lungs once more, swelling them past their capacity. He threw himself rampant, the better to see, the louder to cry, and he bugled all down the stream to Wormsmere. Delacour! Delacour! Where are you, Delacour? Papa! Her tiny, surprised bleat. She was behind him. Black Pale came down, twisting himself so he could see her. Already by the time his four hooves caught the ground, his mouth was closed and something else was beginning to close. Papa! Oh, Papa! You're back! The child was so happy she could hardly walk straight. De La Cour, his daughter, dappled, alive, blameless, and, oh God, who can understand these things, and a knife in his very soul. She came to him sideways, like a pup in her excitement, laughing in her dark eyes because he was her father and she was his daughter and he was home again. No such child would, in like manner, meet the coyote at his den. Homecoming there would be a different thing. And why was this? Why would a coyote weep to be told that his child was dead? And why, please, say it, please? Because Black Pale on a silver field had, with his own hoof, killed the child. Murderer. Papa, such things I have to tell you, my auntie and me. Delacour closed the distance between them. The great stag lowered his head, almost as it were for battle, presenting his antlers. But then he swung it to the side. Oh! The fawn, da the fawn gave a tiny cry. You're cut. Auntie, Papa's been cut, and his neck and his shoulders. How deep! The fawn and the crippled hen together approached Black Pale, full of concerns for him. Before they reached him, in a restless gesture, a nearly threatening gesture, if any had thought that possible, he jerked his body backward. Here was the tragedy. Here was the knowledge that flooded Black Pale now. He could not look upon his daughter, no, not with his eyes, because he was a murderer. She did not know this, he did. And what had he killed? A child. He pawed through the snow to the ice of the Liverbrook, his head still cast to the side. Papa, let us put a salve. Crack! Black Pale struck the ice with his guilty hoof. Delacour hesitated a moment, confused. The shock of his strikes shook something loose inside his chest. Black Pale heaved out his breath, and with it came a dollop of the brightest blood, impossibly red in white snow. This time Delacour's concern was no minor daughterly thing. It was scribbled with true fear, 
and she came forward in low voice. You're not well. It was hard on you, Papa, but Auntie... Crack! Crack! Twice more, with all the might in his shoulder, all the weight of his great body, Black Pale struck the ice, the same hoof, the same place. The fawn pulled herself up short. Ice chips hit her. The expression on her face began to show its own pain. Papa? Crack! And even while he splintered and chopped at the liver brook, his breathing bubbled up more and more blood. He was digging a hole. He spat in the snow around him. Oh, Papa, look at you, wailed little Delacour. You're so hurt. Can't I? Crack. Can't I come to you? What's the matter? Crack. Won't you look at me? Papa. Crack. Papa, bawled the poor fawn bending forward and thrusting her head toward him like any calf. What did I do? Why are you mad at me? And when, with a final tremendous blow, the stag broke through and rammed his leg to the shoulder in icy waters, she cried, Aren't you glad to see me any more, Papa? But this is what Black Pale was doing. He was trying to cleanse his hoof of the blood of the baby, to shock from it the feeling of a backbone snapping. He had splintered utterly that hoof. He had compacted his knee and fractured the shin, and now the water was numbing it all, and still that snap, and still the soft sensation lingered, indelible forever. Murderer. Black Pale put his face into the snow. He spoke. Not to answer Delacour, nor even to address her. It was as though she weren't there. She began a keening, heartbroken moan. She couldn't help herself. She was just a child. It was to the hen that Black Pale spoke. He said, She calls you auntie, he said. Well and good. Now let her call you mother, he said. She needs a parent. She needs that goodness. She is your child now forever and ever till the end. Your child... This was the last thing he said. While his daughter watched him, he withdrew the offending leg from its bloody puncture in the brook. He stood shakily and began to walk away to the south. Suddenly, Delacour raised her voice to the highest sorrow she had inside of her and cried after him, But what did I do wrong? Papa! 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 He didn't stop then. He stumbled farther and farther, and then it was the stumbling alone that dropped him. For a while, his legs continued a walking motion, though he lay on his side, but this was because he'd been granted his heart's wish. He'd slipped into unconsciousness. God had created him a noble character, black pale on a silver field, so that he could not countenance a treachery, not even when the sinner was himself. Coma was his refuge and in this way the child became the mother. Delacour never left her father's side again, but nursed him day and night, while Chalcedony looked after both of them. The fawn continually wiped blood from her father's muzzle and sang to him when he was racked with coughing. She could do this without his denying it now, could love him anyway, because he was unconscious.'